Welcome to Sam's Business Growth Show. I'm Sam Dunning, a digital marketing, sales, and business growth evangelist. Tune in and subscribe today as I'll be interviewing business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. You'll be learning their story, how digital marketing has helped them along the way, and exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your own business. And Sam, I am all yours. Thanks for having me on your show. Awesome. Rob, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it and really excited to jump straight in. So a quick intro for your good self, Rob. I understand you became a self-made multimillionaire by the age of 30 after overcoming huge debts. I understand you've co-founded Progressive Property, the UK's leading property training company, as well as unlimited service with your business partner. I'm host of the Disruptive Entrepreneur and the Money Podcast, listened to a whopping 192 different countries, author of eight books, given over 1,200 speeches in the last decade, also holding two world records for the longest individual speech marathon. Um, As well as this, you run the Rob Moore Foundation. Rob, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing, man? Very good. Always my pleasure. Thanks, Sam. I'm great. Thank you. Awesome. So um, as part of my show, Rob, there's a whole lot of ground that I want to cover, um, s- such as learning your story, learning your valuable tips to help businesses grow, and also the digital marketing strategies that you recommend any business owner, sales specialist, or business growth specialist should be undertaking. But if we can start from the very top, my friend, if we can understand your journey since leaving school and the path that you've taken to build up to now, it would be great to learn it, mate. Right. Wow. I'm going to try and do this in five minutes because I've told my story. Sure, sure, sure. Not that easy to do. But probably from the age of six, I started working for my dad in his pub. Um, it's what we used to call bottling up. So a pub, you know, all the drinks have been decimated the night before, served. You've got empty shelves and fridges. I'd go down like a vertical set of basically a little ladder into the cellar and bring up crates of um, bottles, Schweppes bottles mostly, and I'd bottle up the shelves. And that would pay me a pound a week, and I loved it. And I'd go down to the pound shop and I'd buy pictures of Ferraris, pictures of Lamborghinis, pictures of Aston Martins, pictures of Corvettes. Um, And so from a very early age, my dad taught me to work. My dad taught me the value of money. Um, Yes, he gave me pocket money, but he also made me work for it. Uh, And I kind of wanted to be an entrepreneur a bit like my dad. Cool. Then I went to school and got a bit distracted by the school system, you know, doing lessons I wasn't really that interested in, getting into girls and general mischief and then getting into drinking. Uh, and by the age of 25, I'd got myself about 50 grand in consumer debt, credit cards on credit cards on credit cards, car loans. Um, and that's not even including my mortgage, by the way. And I, I kind of lost my way. December the 15th, 2005, my dad had a massive nervous breakdown in his pub at one o'clock on a Sunday in front of all of his customers while he was carving. He got sectioned, arrested and sectioned by the police. And that was our family's first experience of my dad's bipolar or manic depression, as he's also known. And that that kick-started a few weeks of me beating myself up and feeling really lost and Um, a huge amount of guilt and shame that I was maybe putting a lot of stress on my dad. He paid me to go to school, you know, as in he paid for my private education, paid for me through uni and paid for my accommodation. Uh, And I was a bit lost, flippant, maybe a little bit complacent, maybe a bit cocky even. And that really shook me the hell up. And I spent a few weeks soul searching and then I decided to pull um, myself together and go and make something of my life. Um, I was doing a bit of art on the side, trying to make it as an artist. That wasn't working. But a gallery owner, he had been saying to me, Rob, you should get into property, you should get into property. And I'd been ignoring him. You know, I felt like, well, I haven't got any money and I don't really like, you know, capitalists. I was a bit, I like, used to like to listen to Rage Against the Machine. I used to be a bit <laughs> anti-capitalism, anti-capitalism, anti-money. Ironically, I was skinned. Um, but this time I was a little bit more probably desperate searching. So I went along to a, you know, just a small property network event in Peterborough and I met my business partner, Mark Homer. I'm still business with, partners with today. Awesome. Okay. 15 years on. Um, we bought hundreds of properties together. Like you said, I became a millionaire um, before the age of 31 um, just because I felt like I found a, a calling a, f- a fire in me, I suppose, that was already there, but I would, uh, 
my fire had turned into a little boiler pilot light. It was always there, but it was just a little pilot light. And I kind of got it. Okay, Rob. So you're saying you were around 50k or so in debt when you're about 25 or so. Obviously, your dad had this massive incident, which was a huge blow. And that was sounds like it was a turning point when you realized you had to kind of turn things around. You wanted to focus on, on the business side of things, but you were quite into art at the time, you said. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. But then you, you heard about this um, property event, which you went to, met your, met your future business partner. But what, what were the steps you took to get yourself out of this massive debt hole? and turn things around. What exactly happened, Rob, and how did you spin it? Okay, so the first thing was I um, started to meet up with this guy, Mark, Okay. Uh, probably once to twice a week. He gave me some books to read, and I read them. With, I always read the books he gave me before I went back to see him. So he gave me Think and Grow Rich, Richest Man in Babylon. Um, he gave me a few others and instead of like taking a month to read them, I'd read them in two days and then go back and see him having read the book and ask for more. Now I hadn't read a book before then since fantastic Mr. Fox when I was like seven years old, <laughs> but never, I'd never been into reading. I actually didn't like reading. I'm not actually that good at reading. You know, when you read and I say the oh. words out, I'm slow at reading. I Dude, I'm watch. exactly the same. Like I'll read a page and it'll take me like two minutes. My girlfriend will read a page. She'll be done in about 10 seconds. And she's like, Sam, why are you so slow? So I know exactly what you mean there. So thank goodness now for audio books that you can put on two times speed because that's really accelerated yeah. my learning. Um, and Mark was really impressed and he was like, wow, Rob, you know, you're not normal. Normal people don't read these books. So we, we um, started going out uh, on weekends together and building a friendship. And then um, within two months, he'd help me blag a job at this property company. So my plan was I'll do my art evenings, weekends anyway, because I was painting at like two in the morning, listening to heavy metal and getting, being very depressed. Um, so I thought, well, I'll work for this property company in the day. I was prepared to actually do it for free to get some education. Okay. Uh, but we managed to get me on minimum wage and a commission. Um, and Mark sort of took me under his wing, really. And he said, look, these kind of properties are not so good. These kind of properties are good. This is how to sell on the phone. This is how to generate the leads for the client. This is how to we, we um, source the properties. And he, and he took me under his wing and he sort of taught me and mentored me along the way. Um, so is this like estate agency, Rob, or what was it exactly you were doing and what did you learn whilst you were doing it? It was a property sourcing company. Got it. So not really an estate agency, but, but, but similar. It was, but it was selling investment properties, not residential properties. Okay. And so... Uh, I sold my way out of debt by either selling property deals in this property training company. Um, I refinanced one of my houses and paid off a bit of debt. Well, the only house I had actually. Um, and Mark and I joined venture together where he would put up all the money for the property, but he would also de-risk his money completely and then we would share upside. So any equity we saved by buying it cheap or any growth we got or any cash flow we got with half 50-50, but if he bought the property for say 75 grand, his 75 grand would be protected. So he wasn't taking any risk. Uh, and we bought nearly 20 together in that year for ourselves and some for investors. And then we bought 30 the next year um, for ourselves and some for investors. So okay. I got, I got right. myself out of, out of debt by a combination of selling products and services for a company, doing a bit of art on the side and building a property portfolio um, in a joint venture with Mark. And so I got, I got out of debt completely. I bought a two-year-old Nissan 350Z. I mean, I have a Lamborghini Aventador, a Ferrari Testarossa, a Porsche Panamera Turbo S. I have all sorts of cars now. But actually, my pound for pound, my favorite car ever, I had a Nissan GTR 750 brake. I had an Aerial Atom, which was 0 to 16.7 <laughs> seconds. I had the old Panamera Turbo. But pound for pound, my favorite car was that Nissan 350Z, even though it was, what, a 20 grand car, not a 300 grand car. Nice one. I was able to buy it cash and I got myself out of a hole and I was back in the game and I wasn't in debt anymore and I felt, felt like my life was moving. So, um, yes, I, I turned myself, my life around in a year. Really. Awesome. Okay. So it sounds like you, you went to this property company, you learned a whole bunch of skills in terms of, was it mainly selling was, that you learn or was there other, other skills that you've utilized in later life that you learned at this company? Or I learned selling, marketing, property investing and public speaking. They were the four main things I learned. That's a lot for a year. Nice. And you know what? If I could give you four main skills today that would really benefit you in your life, they would be selling, marketing, property investing, and public speaking. 
So in a way, there was some luck there because I didn't know I was going to become a public speaker, like you said, two world records, over 1,400 speeches. Now I'm a paid keynote speaker. Um, but about two thirds of the way through that year, our boss came to Mark and I, sat us down, the three of us, because only three of us in the company at that time. And he said, hey, look, we've got an opportunity to go and sell our property deals at, 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 at a speech in front of two or 300 people. Who's going to be the speaker? And they both sort of looked at me and I went, uh, me. I had no idea how to do a public speech. I'd never done one before. I was really nervous even just put my hand up to say it. But because they were more experienced than me in property investing and selling and marketing, I thought, well, if they don't want to do it, I'm doing it. I'm stepping up. This is my chance to step up. Uh, and and I, um, I cut a deal with my boss. And that was he would pay for my speaking course. He would pay for my um, accommodation. I paid for my flights. We got me trained in public speaking. And then we did a little deal where um, I would get a commission and he would get a commission on all speaking that I did. And so it, that was very much a win-win. So yeah, yeah. Sales is vital, marketing is vital, public speaking is vital, property investing. I own hundreds of properties now with myself, my business partner, our joint venture partners. Our letting awesome. agency manages 800 and something properties. And this all kicked off. My breakthrough year was 2006. 2006, okay, nice. So you, yeah, like you're saying, Rob, you, you met up with your now business partner. Um, you had this this break this this great year where a lot of things happened for you. Um, what was the process where you've where you've kind of built it up to, to where it is now, Rob? What were the steps that you both took to take it from just starting out with properties into becoming a highly successful business? And how were you able to scale it in the way that you have? What's helped you along the way? Okay, so step one was um, getting myself educated. Step two was getting this almost like amazing work experience for nine months and as a bonus, earning about a hundred grand. So that's um, the next step. The next step was Mark and I set up on our own in 2007 and set up Progressive Property. The next step was we started selling deals to other people. Once we bought a few properties ourselves and they either ran out of money or couldn't grow at the volume that we wanted or had deals but couldn't fund them. Because even if you're Alan Sugar, you can't fund every property deal that comes your way. So then we started selling deals to other people and that was the next step. The step after that, maybe a year or two on, was people were saying, oh, Rob, I'd love you to teach me what you do. I'd love to be a property investor myself. So I wrote a book called Property Investing Secrets and then we started a property investing masterclass course. And so that was the next step. And that in 2000, maybe four or five years ago, that became the UK's largest property training company in terms of size of turnover and number of customers that we have to my knowledge um so the tra- the property training a- aspect of it was the next step obviously at this point i'm hiring staff and i'm growing a a real business not just me and mark and you know our mum's helping us out which it was <laughs> in 2006 yeah i mean how did that how did the business start rob were you both working from home initially like how were the steps when you when you kind of moved into taking up an office and what yeah. was the stage when you realized that this was a business that could actually go somewhere and that could be scaled up? And we worked from home for probably the first 18 months because obviously the overhead is much lower. Of so course. we were just selling deals and writing the book and doing the website and doing the marketing and doing the Google ads. And we were doing all that from home. When you run seminars or masterclass courses, you can do them from you know, a venue in Peterborough or we did the odd one in London. You know, you don't have to have a big training suite like we do now. We can fit probably 450 people in our training suites, um, the three rooms we have over there. So obviously we're bigger now. Um, And then we only moved out of my little office, which could only really fit two people in. And when my mum's and Mark's mum were working for us, they were were working in my living room. We put two desks in my living room. But this was good because we kept our overhead really lean. Um, But then when we needed staff and we didn't have enough room, then we went into a serviced office where we just um, got one room and say paid £450 a month all in. And then as we grew, we got the room next door and paid another £300 all in. So we were were keeping the cost really lean to grow. And is that something you recommend for any startup or new business, Rob? Kind of watch your overheads, keep it lean? It depends because we probably were a bit tight on some of our costs. I don't think we hired quick enough, Sam. Okay. Looking, looking back, we were probably just a little bit too cautious about hiring. Also, um, if you raise investment and you want to grow your company quickly, you might actually want to hire staff and you might not want to be lean. I mean, 
you know, um, how many years were Twitter unprofitable? Um, and, and if you've got investment backing, so you've got 500 grand or 5 million quid that you've got for investment, you might actually want to hire up fast to get market share quick. If you haven't got any investment and you're growing organically, i.e. without fuel, fueling it with cash and the cash comes from the sales you make, then yeah, you need to stay lean in the early days. That makes sense. Um, so Rob, as we said at the start, you're a self-made multimillionaire. So how long was it that you, you were both in business, you and your business partner, until you got to that stage where you're turning over the millions? So uh, uh, just to, to be clear on the definition. So when, when I say I'm a millionaire, that's not my turnover, that's my net worth. So I mean, we, sure. were, turning, we were turning over more than a million before I became a millionaire because obviously if we're turning over one million, Netmark and I might have got 100 grand a year each. So, you know, you could say I properly started in business in 2007, January 2007, we incorporated Progressive um, and, and I became a millionaire, what, nearly four years later. I couldn't tell you the exact dates. I knew it was before 31, but after 30, because I had a really big goal in my life to be a millionaire by 30. So I felt like I missed my goal by a few months. Um, so, yeah. People always ask, well, what's the definition of a millionaire? Well, it's simple. Your net worth of a millionaire is when you have assets minus all your liabilities of one million or more in the form of equity or cash. Um, and so I was tracking my net worth from probably 2008. Um, and so I'd track it and I'd say, oh, I'm worth 100 grand. I'm worth 300 grand. I'm worth 500 grand. I'm worth 900 grand. I'm worth 1.2 million. I'm worth 2 million. I'm worth 3 million. I'm worth 5 million. And Got I still... It. I track my net worth because I think it's really important. You cannot master what you do not measure. But I guess by the time I became a millionaire, maybe our companies were turning over two or three million, or something like that. But again, I haven't got the numbers in front of me. No worries. All right, Rob. Well, thanks for sharing your story so far. Um, it would be interesting to learn some of the biggest highs and biggest lows of your journey so far, if you could share with us some of those. Okay, so uh, some of the biggest sides, I think getting the world record for the individual public speech. Um, I actually got a standing ovation when I walked back into the office because I'd been 47 and a half hours with no break or no sleep. Well, wow. what was the speech hours. about? Um, it was about property and business. Makes sense. About for 147 hours. Um, and so that was, a, that was a really good moment. Becoming a millionaire was a great moment just because it was important to me. And it's okay for money to be important to you. Now I'm worth much more than I was when I became a millionaire. Money is not as important to me. Um, sometimes I think it maybe should be more important to me because I do a lot of things for charity and I do a lot of things for free and I help my clients out a lot and I do 20, 25 one-to-one calls a week for free. So, so I'm not really that money driven anymore compared to how I was. Um, I've raised a lot of money for charity over the years, which makes me feel really good. Having a company that's the biggest in our sector feels really good. Being a best-selling published author feels really good. Having a successful podcast feels really good. The amount of people we've helped in our communities feels really good. You know, when you get um, messages saying that, you know, I've inspired someone to start their business or they've become a millionaire thanks to my work. Or even when they say things like, I was really struggling and down and you keep me going through my hard times, that all feels really good. It felt amazing to become a parent. So there's lots of moments um the low moments um might be uh, when we had one year in 2010 where we did a big event which was actually quite successful but the costs were so high that we had our hardest cash flow moment then um, about two or three months we really had to drill down and reduce all of our costs that was quite a hard time okay um and how I, did you overcome that um by slowing down how quickly we paid invoices <laughs> Um, and being much more, Mark signed off every invoice, taking, taking a much closer look at our costs, and also um, not just running periodic big events, but running smaller events more regularly to even out the cash flow. So that's how we overcame that. Um, I, I don't really have that many low moments. I have challenges every day, Sam, because you get to a certain size in business where there is no good day and there is no bad day. There is just good and bad in every day. Um, so I've had, our builder went bust quite recently. We'd, nev we'd never had a builder go bust on a small or large, Sam, for 
14, 15 years of investing in property. And then our biggest project, 85,000 square foot, like 20 ish million pound end value, which if that was in London would be 200 million, depending on where. Um, and we gave our builder 300 grand for their first tranche of money to start, and it just went bust, and we lost that. And then we had to take the project over ourselves. And oh man, okay. So that was a that was a pretty big blow by the sounds of it. Yeah, I mean, a hundred unit development. That is wow. So that was obviously not much fun, and that happened a few weeks ago. Um, oh, that was really recent then. I had a little bit of a wobble last year because I, there were quite a few things around me going wrong, and. I, I did feel like there was a lot of pressure on me and I felt quite alone. I actually ended up, I'm hiring a therapist. Um, I, I have I've had mentors, coaches, I've, I go on loads of courses, I'm in masterminds, but I'd never actually had a therapist before. And I thought, well, maybe I should try that because, you know, a mentor wants to fix or a mentor wants to give you solutions, but, my, but often you don't get a full chance to air how you feel, whereas a therapist will just let you air everything. And that's been healthy for me. So. Awesome. No, it's refreshing to hear you opening up about this kind of stuff as well, Rob. So that's, that's good to hear. Okay. So there's, there's been a whole bunch of highs and a few, few big blowing lows as well by the sounds of it. Um, Rob, on this show, we like to take the angle of how digital marketing has helped you and your business grow um, amongst the years. So are there any digital marketing channels that you can recommend to any listeners, any business owners, or people thinking of starting a business or anyone in business or sales generally? What are the yeah. digital marketing channels that have helped you to scale your business so far? Well, most of our business is done digitally. Uh, most of our marketing is done digitally. And I would almost say what digital marketing channel doesn't work, not what does. YouTube ads are fantastic for us at the moment. Facebook ads have been great for years. Google ads were brilliant in the mid 2000s and every year they've got a bit less effective for us, but really that space has just moved into Facebook ads. Facebook groups are an amazing source of customers and clients and community members. Um, I have a supporter program on um, Facebook, which is quite rare. Not many people in the world have that. And that's, um, I have 2,500 premium supporter subscribers. Patreon is a great source of revenue for giving people extra products and services where you can get a residual income. We're living out here on Instagram, so I obviously reach quite a lot of people on Instagram. My podcast reaches, it's actually now 202 countries across the world. Um, right. We've had millions of downloads and subscribers for, for my podcast. So um, YouTube, we're really upping our game on YouTube, putting more content out, better quality, and we're getting hundreds of new subscribers a week organically. Um, actually, we get between, on, on a really bad week, we might get 1,500 new followers. On a really good week, we might get 6,000 if we're running a competition plus, just on social media for free with no ads. I think we've got 2,700 this week. <laughs> yeah. So that there's no ads, no spend. We're just putting out content and we're organically getting. Now, if I wanted to pay that for a, a, a lead on Google or Facebook or YouTube, that might cost me... Eight quid, yeah. 12 quid. Let's do that. Yeah, let's do 2,700 times 10. Well, there you go. 27,000 pounds that would cost me a week. A week in lead generation to get that many followers. So social media is a great digital marketing source. Now I do free and paid, because the thing with free is it's more organic, it's more unpredictable, it's slow. The thing with paid is you can ramp it up, speed it up, it's more predictable, but of course you're taking risks because it costs money. No, that's it. Okay, Rob, well, it sounds like you're investing in a whole bunch of channels, pretty much. And is that advice that you would give to businesses to invest into all channels? Or would you be a bit more specific? For example, if there's startups listening, should they be looking to go in, invest money in paid ads? Should they be looking at all the social channels? Should they be trying to do their website and guide people to there? Or is there specific advice that you could give to these yeah, kind of startups? Is. So I think you should be on all the channels. Um, because right now, nowadays, people don't just use Google for search. They use Facebook for search. They use Instagram for search. They use podcast for search. They use YouTube for search. Whereas what? 10 years ago, 15 years ago, everyone was really using Google for search. So people forget now all these new social platforms. They're also search engines. So if you don't have a YouTube channel set up, if you don't have a podcast, if you don't have an Instagram profile, if you don't have a Facebook group and a Facebook page and a Twitter feed, 
then you're not searchable on all those channels. But what you can't do is divide your time 10% across 10 channels because you end up getting nowhere. So what we do is we're on all the channels, even TikTok and the newer ones and Patreon now and support. We're on all the channels, but we might, we might focus 70% of our time on the main one. So at the moment, that's probably Facebook. 20% of time on a couple, and that might be, for example, um, podcast, YouTube, Instagram, and then 10% on all the others. So we're still, we're on them all, but we're dividing our time non-equally. Because people, you know, often say, I've got 10 jobs to do today, I'll divide my time between the 10. But one job might be worth 10 grand, and one job might be worth 10 pence. So, you, you, you know, no two tasks that you have or social media platforms that you have, have the same value of time. Got it. And um, would you say there's one specific digital marketing channel that people should be looking at right now? From my own perspective, Rob, uh, our company Web Choice, I can say that LinkedIn's probably giving us the best ROI because it has such a great organic reach. Yeah. And the engagement is so high if you spend the daily time. But is there one channel that you'd say that businesses need to be using? Okay, so actually, you just reminded me, Sam, websites, I think, are less relevant nowadays. Oh, really? I, that? I, I, well, I Google searched someone who's a LinkedIn, well, he calls himself a LinkedIn trainer. I don't know him, but I just thought I'd do this as a test. So I'm not saying he's not, or he is, but that's what he calls himself. And I Googled him because he made a point on LinkedIn about, um, well, you know, you, your website might not rank anymore. When I Googled myself, my website was ranked number one. Uh, and my LinkedIn profile was ranked number six on, on, on the first page of Google. When I Googled him, his LinkedIn profile was ranked number one on Google. Yeah. And, 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 and there was about six other um, pages like HubSpot was one and a blog was one before a website. So okay. a Facebook page or a podcast page or a LinkedIn profile can now rank one, two, three, four, five on Google. Now on LinkedIn, you can have as much web, uh, as much information on your LinkedIn profile as you can your website. On your Facebook page, you can have so much content on there. So whereas in 2006, if you didn't have a website, you weren't seen. Now you don't necessarily need it. You can whip, whip one up and it looks quite good and it doesn't cost you much money and you do it on WordPress fine. But people are, you know, some websites cost 30 grand, waste of time and money, just populate your LinkedIn profile um, and populate your Facebook page and then you've got assets on page one of Google. Now that question, Sam, the second question, there is no one all singing, all dancing, superpower social media platform. Because if you are an interior designer or a chef, Instagram is probably better than LinkedIn. If you're in recruitment, LinkedIn is hands down the best. If you do, um, if you've got a voice for radio and you've got a radio or broadcasting background, podcasting is going to be better. If you're brilliant on video and you're great at editing, YouTube is going to be better. So you couldn't say one is better. What I would say, though, and I'm going to agree with you on this, Sam, the great thing about LinkedIn is organic reach kills all other platforms because Facebook will give you reach within your followers, whereas LinkedIn will give you outside of your follower reach. Exactly. No, I, I completely agree. And I'm glad that you said, Rob, that there's no specific channel that wins it all. I, I'm under the exact same view that you have to understand one what works for you in terms you of if you're comfortable with yeah. and yeah. so like you say yeah what you like sometimes you've got to think what do i what am i good at some people are really good at written some people are really good at video some people are really good at audio some people do not want to be on camera full stop exactly. so then youtube's no good for them but podcast is perfect for them if you're brilliant at writing and you write detailed articulate professional articles you want to use all the blog channels so you've Agreed. got to know your strengths. You've got to, what are you already good Like I can use Facebook pretty well. I'm not the biggest guru in the world, but we have loads of Facebook groups. We have my Facebook page. We have supporters. We have stars. We have all these cool new tools. And if I want to go live on Facebook, I'll go button, button, button live. But if I want to go live on Instagram, Kieran is here will tell you, like I'm always faffing around and I press the story button by accident. And <laughs> it's, it's just more of a faff for me to get that figured out. Whereas you are way more comfortable on Instagram. Happy to do that, yeah. Easy to do. Yeah. Makes sense. So 
also think about what you're most comfortable with using and what you know the best. And then also, what platform works the best for your industry. Makes sense. No, that's, that's just the point I was going to add, actually. There's, there's no point looking into a channel that your ideal customers are not on. So yeah. if you're a business, but your prospective customers don't actually use LinkedIn and you're spending all your time on LinkedIn, then it's pretty much effortless. So make sure you're actually investing in the channel that your customers are on. Um, and this is another important bit to add, Sam, engagement. A lot of people are posting and running or slapping stuff across social. It's better to do one post a week and fully engage with it than five posts a week and never go in and comment and respond to people who take the time to respond to you. Now with LinkedIn, I always used to think with LinkedIn, you post, you need a good amount of comments in the first hour or two and then the reach just goes. But actually, the more you engage, the reach continues to expand and expand and expand. And like the long tail burn on um, a LinkedIn post, it could keep getting organic reach for weeks. Whereas on other social media platforms, you need that sort of short, sharp hit, like a sparkler that burns itself out. So go and engage in your posts. I've been putting quite a lot of comments in, in a social media debate on LinkedIn the last two days, replying to people who are replying to me, who are I'm replying to. Now they get to know who I am. Now they know I'm just not just posting or running or trying to be some out of touch influencer. They know that I'm actually networking and connecting with them. We all have dead time when we're in the queue, when we're waiting around, you know, whatever you're doing, you can just go and make a few comments. No, I think that's sound advice. And I, I definitely say if you've got a spare time, then get, get active on those social media channels that your audiences are on. Okay, cool. So good to learn about the digital marketing channels that have helped you, Rob, and the ones that you recommend for listeners. So for anyone that has recently started a business or anyone that's thinking about starting a business, have you got any exclusive tips or insights that you can share with them, Rob, on what they should be doing and the best ways to the best practices if you're thinking of starting a new biz or just started one? Okay, so I think you should probably figure out what you enjoy doing for the most part, or at least if it was hard, you would still put yourself through it. Like if you're really passionate about martial arts, you actually enjoy a good hard sparring session. And that's the test, whereas a lot of people are starting a business and as soon as it gets hard, they're like, oh, I'm out, this is crap. So um, the business model should be, you're either very passionate about it or you would endure the challenges. That's the first thing. The next thing is that you need to be able to monetize it. And a lot of people are really just starting hobbies uh, and there's, they've got guilt around charging or they haven't really created the angle of actually commercializing. It needs to be commercial if, it needs, if it's going to be a business. Um, I think the next thing is you need to be customer focused and think about, okay, how do I serve people? What problems do I solve? Could many people benefit from this? Is this meaningful? Does it matter? Does it do some good? Does it help people? Does it fix them? Serve them, solve them, save them? That's the next thing. And then of course, you've got to make sure that there's a marketplace, you know, because some people, you know, they want to decorate cakes in only blue icing. Well, that's lovely and it's a niche. Actually, I did have someone who said pretty much that. Um, but that, but that's, there's not a market for that. So they're the, they're the four core elements of starting a business. Then I think you should be leveraging low cost and free social media because most social media platforms are access to your followers, your fans, your prospects, and your clients. Uh, and you can join a niche Facebook group. Let's say, for example, you, what do you do? Um, my sister, she buys and sells like jewel clothing. And okay, nice. Kind of, um, you know, I don't know what, what boutique brands yeah. and she goes into um, buy, sell and exchange groups on Facebook. I um, run property courses and there are at least five UK property Facebook groups with 20,000 plus yeah. members in. I'm into hi-fi and there's two really big hi-fi groups for people who are just into hi-fi. So if you're a hi-fi dealer, that's going to be a great place. So getting in the niche groups, and getting involved and on all the social media channels. The next thing then is you've got to be putting a lot of information out there. You know, the person who puts the most content out there wins at the moment. Um, so more content, faster, more volume frequent. Volume over quality, Rob? Sorry? Volume over quality? 
Yeah, volume over quality. Now, not volume in the expense of quality. And of course, quality always wins. I believe in any business, the best always rise to the top. And there's always room in any busy, mar busy marketplace for the best. But I wrote a book called Start Now, Get Perfect Later. And if you're starting, should your content be perfect or should it be done? Should you be perfect or should you be prolific? Now I can tell you this, Sam, some of my best content has come from ideas from other content I've put out there. Now, we don't have to be binary because you can be prolific, you can be high volume and good quality, but usually quality slows down too much the volume. Also, social media channels and their algorithms seem to be rewarding volume. So if you wanted to gain the algorithms, you actually don't have to have good quality content. The best content to gain the algorithms is not the best quality. I did a test once, I wrote a deep dive article, I took a full chapter of a book, put it on Facebook, I got reach of one. And it was a full oh. chapter of a paid book. Um, and then I, I did another test because I saw someone post this in a group and I thought it was the most ridiculous post ever. And I thought, I'm gonna take, the, I'm gonna take a bit of Nikki here and, and see what happens. Um, and I posted on my Facebook page, do you sleep naked? And there were hundreds of comments. <laughs> so Facebook liked, do you sleep naked? better content than a full chapter of a paid book. So you've got to find that sweet spot balance between the content, the social media channels like, so it gets, because there's no point writing beautiful art, but it never gets shared. So it can't be too long, you know, it can't be too wordy, it can't be too technical, you've got to do it in the format that they want. So you're, you've got this trade off between hardcore quality of your art and then what the algorithms want. And by the way, what's the best way to figure out how the algorithms work? Chuck a load of content out there and watch what happens. So Completely yeah, you are rewarded for quantity over quality, but it doesn't have to be quantity at the expense of quality. Awesome. Okay, well those are some, some great tips. And are there, are there specific habits, Rob, that people should be following to make sure their business is a success? Uh, yeah, there, there are plenty. I won't give you all the generic ones like work hard and believe in yourself. They're obviously important, but you can get them anywhere on the internet for free. I would say one is emotional control. So every day as a business owner, a client might pay late. Someone might criticize you. I'll give you this, Sam, as, as a little um, example. Um, my sister has had a chronic kidney infection for a long time. She's been struggling to get any um, op care and operation on the NHS. And apparently they're just so overloaded. She got her operation put back six months last oh, week. Dear. She's at her wit's end. She's put on loads of weight. She can't even go to bed. She has to sit up to sleep. She's lived on the sofa for God knows how long. And um, she, off her own back, put up a GoFundMe page. Now, I could afford her operation, but she didn't ask me for the money because she wanted to do it on her own. I shared her GoFundMe on three of my platforms and we, we raised the 15 grand she needed in less than a day. And I felt fucking amazing about that, Sam. Um, and by the way, I'm a big critic of myself and I often don't allow myself to feel good, but I felt great about that. And uh, that same day, some guy went and put a massive hate campaign up against me that um, I, he was disgusted with me and I was disgusting because I'm a multimillionaire and I should have paid for it myself and not put um, the link and the page up on my social media and, and crowdfunded it. So that's an example where no matter how much good you do, someone will hate you. Someone will hate about you the very thing that's great about you. So every day people are going to criticize you, troll you, pay late, promise something and do something else, waste your time, waste your money, be unfair towards you but you have to smile and you have to maintain your own energy and your own enthusiasm and your own drive and your own gratitude. And you have to keep your mouth shut and not blur out every problem and challenge you've got. Otherwise no one will want, want to do business with you. And business has taught me emotional control. Now that doesn't mean I don't lose my shit from time to time, but I might lose it twice a year, not twice a day. Like I used to start 
like I used to lose it. Um, and business has taught me that because it's the great barometer. Because if, if something upsets me and I go rant about it, and then my customer gets really angry, angry with me and wants a refund, I've just that's just cost my gob has just cost me five grand. So I've learned to keep my gob shut, even though I find it hard to keep my gob shut. Um, so that's definitely a key skill in business and life is emotional mastery, emotional control. We've all sent the email we regret. We've all got really upset or angry with someone and acted in a way and we really regret it afterwards. You know, when you get Certainly have. <laughs> exactly emotionally hijacked, when you get that cortisol rush. So for me, that's the biggest lesson in business and life is to endure those 90 second cortisol hits and not ruin your life and not lash out and not, um, you know, like be unfair and aggressive. Yeah. That's a great way to look at it, Rob. Emotional control. I've not really heard it in that phrased in that way before. But like you say, a lot of a lot of times where think, things feel they're at the worst, it's only a very short time in, in the history of ninety seconds when you've been doing things. It's exactly when you feel you... when you feel cortisol hijacked, i.e., your body goes into complete lack of control and you just feel this immense stress come over you, that lasts maximum ninety seconds. So walk away. Get on your own, stick some headphones on, <laughs> shut your mouth. Because I, I know I've made most of my mistakes are in those 90 seconds. I would say 90% of my mistakes in my whole life are in those 90 seconds. When you just go, ah, and shout at your kids, even though it wasn't their fault. Or you just blur out something on social media. The next thing, Sam, is people talk about persistence. And I believe it's important to be persistent, but I believe it's even more important to be consistent. And I think people get the two confused. Consistency is following a repeatable process without a lack of enthusiasm, without a loss of enthusiasm, and every day following a routine and performing you know, a, a task or a day or a process better and better and better. Persistence is that like dogged determination, just keep pushing, 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 pushing. Well, sometimes when you keep pushing, 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 you push people away. You know, if you're chasing someone for a podcast interview, Sam, let's say you're, let's say I'm chasing you to get on your podcast. Well, how many times do I push you before you go, bloody hell, he's a bit desperate. I'm not going to go on this shit. That, yeah, that's a great point, Rob, for anyone listening, especially if you're in sales or in your business development or trying to grow your customer acquisition. How do you go about chasing someone that you want to do business with or you want to invite to something without sounding pushy, rather yeah. adding value so they want to work with you or collaborate with you? Yeah, so I think there's two schools of thought here. So Grant Cardone would say you just keep pushing 10x until you get there. I interviewed the uh, founder of Grenade and he said, I'll ask someone once. I'm not asking them again because I'll, I'll just prove to them that they should have said yes. And they'll come back to me when they're ready. I think I'll probably sit somewhere in the middle. So if we go for a great guest for our podcast and they decline, normally what we do is approach them again in three to six months. We don't go, oh, come on, oh, no, 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 you know, pound them every five minutes. Um, so, yeah, maybe somewhere in the middle. And also, if you're going to go back to someone, go back to them with something. Don't just go, oh, come on, do it. Go back to them with uh, some new information or a new offer um, and be smart with the way that you communicate with them. No, that's that's great great bit of advice. I mean, I I try to do similar when I try to invite people on on the show, just like you kindly join me, Rob. Try to add a little bit of value. So whether that's like I read something that you posted recently on LinkedIn that was really great. I actually interviewed X the other day, and we talked about something similar. Check this out. I think you might be interested. Plus, you can plug your company at the end of my show. How does that sound? So yeah. offer them something in return, rather than just asking, well, asking, it. asking. We all know the sort of person that never really is bothered about us until they want something. Now, I have no problem with asking for something I really need if I really need it. But if I have given or at least communicated without the desire for asking for something for someone a few times, I've built a bit of goodwill to ask them. So I just send random voice memos saying, hey, thanks for being a good mate. Thanks for being an awesome partner. Thanks for being a friend. I think you're an absolute legend. It's quite funny, um, Jay uh, Alderson's become quite a good friend of mine. And I just voice memoed him a couple of days ago because I've seen some of his work and I think he's doing some cool work. And just, I just voice memoed him and I said, Jay, I just want to tell you you're a fucking legend for no reason at all, but I think you're a legend. I just felt like doing it. I probably had a, a strong coffee. And he sent me a made up message back. And I meant that. But why don't we do random nice things like that instead of just messaging people when we want something? 
Cool. Okay. Well, we've covered a lot of ground so far, Rob. Um, we've learned all about your story. We've learned your digital marketing recommended strategies for helping startups grow. Is there one thing that people should be doing or businesses rather should be doing with digital marketing that's going to benefit their business that they can start today? Yeah, I think, I think LinkedIn and Facebook groups okay. are two of the best places to find un, virtually unlimited reach and your ideal client. So that would be one thing, leveraging those, but we've kind of already mentioned that. The next thing would be understanding the power of the personal brand and not just having a company brand, but a personal brand. Now, personal brand, influencer, thought leader, content creator, commentator, you know, these are all terms which are loaded with emotion. For me, I think it's becoming a commentator for your industry. It doesn't sound as sexy as influencer, but I, I don't ever call myself an influencer. People would put that name upon me if they believe I am. So I am trying to become a commentator and a spokesperson person for what I do, for entrepreneurship, for, for being hopefully a spokesperson for people to be okay with being um, sometimes lost or asking for help or getting therapy, becoming a spokesperson for having a supporter program on the Stars feature on Facebook, which only in the Stars feature only 20 people in the world have, and I have that. Oh, awesome. Becoming a spokesperson for starting your business and scaling your business and a go-to person for the media to come to me and you know other influencers and collaborators to come to me and, and, and for people to be, just be able to learn from me. And I think if I get really well known as a, a go-to commentator in my space, I'm going to attract followers, fans, prospects, clients. I'm going to be able to do collaborations. Media are going to want me. I'm going to get paid for my public speaking gigs. I'm going to get interviewed on a load of podcasts and blah, blah, blah. Awesome, man. Okay. Well, um, just before we wrap things up, Rob, really appreciate your time today. What I like to ask everyone on the show is if you could thank just one person either dead or alive for having a positive influence on your life and your career so far, who would that be and why? There's a million people I'd love to thank. So I'm going to pick a bit of a left field one. I would like to thank my ex boss for firing me Ooh. because in 2006, I had a job in a property company and this guy took a chance on me. And he hired me with no CV or qualifications on the back of Mark giving me a good reference. And Mark had only known me for two months. Now, I worked really hard in that company, and he wouldn't deny that. Um, but in the end, we fell out a bit because Mark and I thought the vision should go one way, and he thought the vision would go another way. Um, and so Mark and I set up Progressive, and he found out on the grapevine that we were planning that. Uh, and he fired me and Mark on the spot, Mark and I on the spot. I was actually doing a reality TV show at the time and I was only picking up messages once a week on a Sunday for an hour and Mark left me loads of messages saying that he was fired and I've been sacked. And we ended up going to a tribunal. We won that tribunal because we were unfairly dismissed. And of course that was 15 odd years ago. And were it not for him taking a chance on me, I might not be where I am today. And yeah, we were unfairly um, dismissed but in a way that was a technicality because we did set up in competition um, and we've had that done to us I don't know how that feels sure but if it weren't for him hmm, you know I might still be painting and, and in debt and I should be really grateful for the people who take a chance on me and he took a chance on me so if he's not he knows who he is I'm not going to mention his name because uh, you know I don't want it to, anyone to think it's critical but um, I got a lot out of the relationship with him and thanks for firing me. <laughs> I like it. It's a bit different, but like you say, it's, that's, people do need to take a chance on people, whether that's you to them or them to you in business. And um, that's, that's awesome, man. So thanks so much, Rob. I appreciate you coming on the, the show today with me. Um, everyone on my show, you've been listening to Sam's Business Growth Show, where we interview business leaders, experts and entrepreneurs from across the globe. We learn their story, how digital marketing has helped along the way and exclusive tips and tricks to help you skyrocket your own business. My show is sponsored by webchoiceuk.com. 
helping businesses grow via results driven digital marketing, conversion focused websites that generate leads and complex web and mobile application development. Rob, really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for coming on. No worries. Can we shout out my show, my podcast? Please do shout out your podcast, your show. How can people connect with you? And so my podcast is called The Disruptive Entrepreneur. Um, it's usually the top UK business podcast. Um, sometimes a cheeky American usurps me from number one, but I'm going to have strong words with my friends over in America. Uh, if you search my name, Rob Moore, R-O-B-M-W-R-E, you can find me on every platform, whether it's books, audio books, um, YouTube videos, loads of content. We do, I do about five or six posts a day now on Facebook, um, obviously my Instagram channel, so you can just find me anywhere you like, whatever platform you prefer. Amazing. Thank you very much, Rob. Thanks, Sam. Take care. Cheers on you. Subscribe today for more digital marketing, sales and business growth tips from the experts.